Welcome. In this video, I introduce the concept of susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered, or SEIR models and their application to the COVID-19 pandemic. A susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered model, or SEIR model for short, considers people to be in one of four categories, susceptible, exposed, infectious, or recovered. We consider the relative populations using a series of differential equations, as shown here for the change in the susceptible population as a function of time, the exposed population as a function of time, the infectious population as a function of time, and then the recovered population. And so essentially we see that these are all related to one another by the parameters S, E, I, and R, and these rate constants K1, K2, and K3. The rate constants that define the relationships between S, E, I, and R in these models essentially take into account three different parameters. The first is the effective basic reproduction number, or RT. The second is the duration of time that an individual is infectious, or T-inf. And then the third is the period for the disease incubation, or T-inc. If we use this type of model, essentially we can predict uh, the relationship between the susceptible population, the exposed population, the infectious population, and the recovered population. An example of that is shown here for influenza A within a swine farm. And essentially, we go from having a very large susceptible population in this instance to having a very rapid exposure period, where the number of exposed goes up and then falls very quickly. And essentially, then those convert to being infectious. That rises and then falls. And then we have a population that is recovering. When we look at an SEIR model, essentially one of the key parameters is going to be what I have circled here, the effective basic reproduction number. To understand what I mean by the effective reproduction number, I'm going to first define what's known as the basic reproduction number, or R0. So by definition, R0 is the average number of individuals that are directly infected by an infectious case during their infectious period when they enter into a completely susceptible population. And that's what I am attempting to illustrate here, where we have an infectious individual who's going to come into contact with a completely susceptible population of 20 people. R0, you could think of it as the number of new cases per case. So what I've done here is I've brought that infectious individual into this population of 20 people. They then make one individual sick. That one individual makes two additional people sick then one of those doesn't affect anybody, but the other goes on to make one person sick who then makes an additional three people sick. One of those makes two people sick. There's a progression to two more. And then ultimately we get to the point where we have our last within this window of people that get sick, but then some of those people make out others outside sick as well. So effectively, we can think about this population as all of the different individuals, so A through M, that have become sick. We can think about the number of people that each of them infected. So if we start here at A, they infected one person, so we have the number infected as one. B infects two people, B1, B2, so this is two, and we continue that through this entire population. Ultimately, we figure out that we've got 15 people that were infected, and each of those, on average, infected 1.15 people. So the R0 in this case is 1.15. So that tells us that this infection is going to develop and move through this population. Now we can break down what R0 is. It's essentially going to be a function of three different things. The first is the risk of disease transmission per contact, which is referred to as beta. The second is the number of contacts an average person has over a period of time, or kappa. And then the third is the duration of disease infectivity. So all three of those give rise to what we define as R0. Now R0, the magnitude of it, is important because if it's less than one, then our disease is going to disappear within our population. If it's equal to one, the disease becomes endemic within the population. And if it's greater than one, then it's going to be an epidemic. Now, R0 is a completely theoretical construct because it assumes that we have a completely susceptible population. 
in the real world, you never have that. You have some people that are going to be immune or other things that make it so that they are not susceptible. So in that case, we deal with what's known as the effective reproduction number, sometimes referred to as RE, R sub T, or R. And essentially, this does not assume complete susceptibility within the population. But we can go back to our basic reproduction number, R0, and we can think about beta and kappa still in the confines of our effective reproduction number. So any way to reduce beta or kappa will lead to a reduction in the effective reproduction number. To see how this SEIR model concept applies to COVID-19, we're going to go back to Wuhan, which is the capital of Hubei province in China, and is essentially the epicenter for the COVID-19 outbreak. And I've included some pictures here of what Wuhan looks like that were available on Wikipedia. So we're going to go to Wuhan, and we're going to look at the epidemic curve for COVID-19. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to break down the period between December 8th, 2019, and February 18th, 2020, into four different periods. So during period one, essentially, Wuhan was operating as normal. So there was normal human movement across the city. There were no travel restrictions. And there was just the very first hint of the initial evidence of COVID-19 within the population. Period two, on the other hand, was marked by massive human migration. Essentially, this was during Chinese New Year, so people were moving all across the country, including within Hunan. There were no travel restrictions, and there was increasing evidence of COVID-19 uh, being transmitted within the local population. It was during that period that human-to-human -human transmission was first determined. Period three is following the emplacement of what's known as a cordon sanitaire around Wuhan. Essentially, this restricted human movement out from Wuhan to the outside. It led to, as part of this, they put in place social distancing, they put in local travel restrictions, and there started to be major issues in terms of medical resources. So there was a shortage of many of the things uh, like gowns and masks that we're seeing uh, in the U.S. at this current time. So this is when the COVID-19 epidemic first started to develop. Period four is essentially after the central government came in and said, we're going to do centralized quarantine, we're going to treat confirmed as well as suspected cases, and travel was still highly restricted. So this is in the latter stages of the COVID-19 epidemic within Wuhan. So I've got a couple of pictures here. Uh, one of these is essentially the deserted streets of Wuhan during the middle of this period where they had the cordon sanitaire in. And then the other is essentially a gymnasium where they have put in place a whole series of beds so that they can may have it be a makeshift hospital to take care of and treat these patients that have been uh, quarantined and separated. So I should point out that the data that I'm showing is from this paper by Wang et al. I'll provide a complete citation for that in a minute. But essentially, in this paper, they went and looked at where the outbreak started and then observed how it spread across uh, the area of Wuhan. And essentially, if we look at the attack rates, which is going to be the number of new cases per day divided by 10 to the 6 people, so it's normalized to 10 to the 6 people, went from 2.2 across the entire area during period 1 to 44.9 in period 2, way up to 150.9 in period 3, and then back down in period 4 to 54.1. So it went up, and then it went back down. And one of the things we also can see is that it started within urban areas, so here in central Wuhan, and then ultimately starts to move elsewhere until it spreads more widely, and then it gets more under control in the latter stages. So these attack rates were a function not only of location, but they were also a function of age of the different people. So we see the highest attack rates for people that are above 60, so 60 to 79 and 80, and it depended on the exact period of time. But we still see attack rates for people even below the age of 20 that are quite large. So attack rates are a function of age, and they also are a function of who different people are. So males and females are roughly the same, but 
a clear outlier were healthcare workers. So they were most susceptible to this particular disease in Wuhan. So to try to understand this disease outbreak, um, this paper by Wang et al. has essentially applied an extended SEIR model um, and used it to really understand all of the different processes that were undertaken to get this uh, outbreak under control. So this model, it's an SEIR model, but what has been added to it are two different things. Um, one box that accounts for unascertained yet infectious people. So these are people that have the disease, can spread it potentially, but are either not sick enough to go to the hospital or don't feel any of the symptoms at all. So that's A, the unascertained infectious. And then they also subdivided the ascertained infectious into those that were hospitalized. So just trying to get a more complete picture than you would get with a standard SEIR model. So using their extended SEIR model, Wang et al. were able to evaluate how different interventions between period one, period two, period three, and period four impacted the effective basic reproduction number within Wuhan. And essentially from that, they found that during the first two periods, when not really much was happening in terms of different interventions, the effective reproduction number was either 3.88 or 3.86. As the cordon sanitaire was in place, then these dropped down to 1.26. And then as the larger scale uh, quarantine went into place, it actually dropped down to 0.32. So the assumptions in this was that the Wuhan population was constant at 10 million. The incubation period for the disease was 5.2 days and an infection period of 2.3 days. They also assumed that the number of unascertained cases was equal to the number of ascertained cases, so 50-50. And there's some debate whether that's actually a reasonable um, assumption or not, but that's what they used in this particular model. So using this model, they actually are able to develop a very good fit to their observed number of cases within Wuhan across these four different periods. So we go from period one, the data is fit here, period two, period three, and period four. And essentially what they see is that they have a good fit between the model in terms of the observed data and the fitted data that they're um, using to understand what's going on. And again, they see that the effective reproduction number changes over the course of time. Another thing that they're able to do as a result of their modeling is essentially determine what the impacts would have been had there been no intervention, which is what's shown here. So if there was no intervention, then the no total number of cases within Wuhan would have just continued to skyrocket. They also can see whether going from just having a traffic ban and home quarantine to the more rigorous uh, centralized quarantine that occurred in period four was necessary. So again, what they would have predicted had they not gone to this more rigorous quarantine was that the number of cases would have continued to rise. So that tells us that you really need to have these rigorous um, centralized quarantine where you're taking cases as well as contacts of those cases, separating them and making sure that they're not infecting other people within the population. Now, if you're at all interested in SCR models, um, you can actually go and use this online epidemic calculator that has been produced and developed by Gabriel Go. It's available on GitHub. And essentially it allows you to play with a variety of different numbers. So you can think about the basic reproduction number, the transmission time, um, both for T-Inc and T-Inf, and you can even start to play with what happens within a clinic. So this allows people that aren't familiar with uh, these types of systems to really get a handle on all of the different things that can occur. To begin to wrap up, I just want to state that SEIR models provide a useful means of interpreting outbreaks of infectious disease. So hopefully that's been made clear by this presentation. But more importantly, from the Wuhan experience, we essentially know that the initial lockdown with the traffic ban and home quarantine was useful, but was not enough. If they hadn't gone to the more rigorous quarantine, the disease would have continued within Wuhan. Centralized quarantine works, 
and it essentially reduces disease transmission by isolated infected patients, suspect cases, as well as close contacts. Third, the testing, testing, testing is required. Roughly 60% of the infected cases are unascertained based on some of the modeling that was done in this um, effort. And those are people that show no or mild symptoms, but still can infect others. So that's an important outcome. The fourth is that you need a multi-pronged approach incorporating large-scale screening, mitigation, and centralized quarantine to get a um, disease epidemic like this under control. The fifth is that vulnerable groups, particularly including healthcare workers, elderly, suspect cases, close contacts, and children should be protected. And then finally, that early diagnosis and early treatment are critical. So all of these uh, details about the modeling and some of the justification for the take-home messages are available in some very nice presentations made by Professor Ji Hong Lin um, at the Harvard School of Public Health. And there's a link for some of her online seminars that have taken people through the same data in a little bit more detail. So with that, let me conclude and just provide my contact information um, if anybody has any questions. Thanks.